Hello everyone, I'm Krishan Veer. I'm developer evangelist with Cisco DevNet. I, I focus on Cisco security technologies. Today with me, I have Jared Smith from Security BU. And today we're going to talk about Firepower Threat Defense APIs. These APIs were released in 6.2.3 version, and I'm really excited about it. And I think today what we're going to talk with Jared is on GET requests, because GET requests are very important. Uh, they generally get request enabled reading objects, and it is something which we do very often, and I think it's a great way to get started on a new API. So Jared, please tell us about the get request and how they can be handled um, in new API. Great, Th thank you, Veer. So my name's Jared Smith. I am an architect focused on Firepower Device Manager and the Firepower Threat Defense API. So th this is definitely an area of interest, and, and as Veer said, this is this is one of the key, most fundamental things that you need to do in a REST API is how do I retrieve the objects? So definitely an area of interest. So we'll walk through three different methods. We'll do the API Explorer, Postman, which is, is, is a frequently used tool, and Python, and using Python scripting to be able to program against the API to retrieve an object. So some of the kind of fundamental things as, as a starter here is what kind of software do I need to go start playing with what we're gonna talk about here? So we have the FTD API Explorer or NGFW API Explorer. So that's included with the firewall. You basically point your browser, and we'll show this in just a second, at, at the URL for the device, and you can pull up the API Explorer. So that's so, kind of- So Jared, what you're uh, mentioning here is that before I get started, yeah. I should download these software on my machine. Yes. Uh, if I'm yeah. doing it at home, before I get started. Yeah, I, that, that, that's the best way to get, get going here. So uh, other than the API Explorer that's kind of inbuilt here, You'll need Python to do the Python example and Postman to, log, to, to be able to play with that tool. So yeah, definitely set, set these up on your laptop ahead of time is, is a great way to get started here. So let me flip over and start showing this. So a couple of key things to note here are we have, you'll, you'll notice that the browser says not secure and that's something that, you, that because we used a self, use a self-signed certificate when you install the product, You'll see that. One of the things you can do to, to mitigate that if, if you find it annoying is you can accept that certificate in your browser and that'll go away. So it's definitely something to keep in mind. Another thing, just given the setup I'm running this demo in, is I have a non-standard port here. That's because this is a lab pod that I have set up for, for myself for running this demo. The typical port would be 443. So, and, and note, it's an HTTPS secure link. So what you would do typically is you do HTTPS colon slash slash either the IP or the host name of the device, and then you wouldn't need to put the port, assuming you didn't, you're not natting it and port mapping it through. So just keep that in mind. And the next thing to do here is to log into the device. That let me just get logged in here. And the default password. So if, if you get a fresh device that you're setting up here, it's admin. And then the default password is admin123 with the, uh, the first character, the A, in uppercase, if, if you don't change it. But typically, when you're, when you're installing the device, if you install it through the command line, you'll be prompted there for a new password. So just remember what password you put. And then the next thing we'll do, so if you use the API Explorer, you will need to tweak the URL at the top. And, and this is the standard kind of da dashboard screen that you'll see when you log in. So you'll adjust the URL, remove device there, and then I'll replace that with API-Explorer, and I'll press enter there. And then what it does is the API Explorer is built on top of OpenAPI spec with Swagger as an API browser. And the, the cool thing here, and, and we get into this later in the, in the presentation, is OpenAPI spec enables us to use different tools that consume OpenAPI spec as a language and can create a SDK for us to program against. So that's a very useful thing that we get here. And then, so in the API browser here, you'll see some text at the top that takes you through some of the high-level content. We have other videos digging through the details on how to use the API Explorer. So I'm gonna kind of jump right in here. And our example is going to be showing how to retrieve a network object. And then after that, we'll jump into Postman to show you how would I use Postman to do the same thing. And, and one of the good things to note here at this point is when I log into the API Explorer, 
it uses the authentication token that I use when I log into the, to the user interface. So you don't need to worry about authentication when you use this method. If I use Postman or Python, I have to log in myself. So definitely something to keep in mind. So I'd say API Explorer, if you're just experimenting around the UI, is, is the easiest way to do it because you don't have to worry about the token authentication. And then Postman or Python is, is a little more manual that way. Another, so, so Jared, I'm sorry to interrupt, but what, what actually you're saying is that a lot of that, 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 that part of getting that token is already done for you in API Explorer. Correct. Right. And if you're doing you, from the scratch in Postman or you're, you, if you're writing a Python code, you have to execute that part of the code to get the token and then get going. Yes. And, 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 and what, why, why did we choose this token? Like this is a standard way of doing API and we just want to follow or did you, we use a standard, some standard for it? Good, good, good question. So we, we, we chose to use OAuth tokens or OAuth with JSON web tokens, which, which is kind of an industry sta standard way to do authentication. So yeah, I mean, we're, we're very much with, with Swagger, with the authentication with OAuth and JSON web tokens. We're, we're trying to be as standard as possible. So hopefully it's familiar for people that are using similar kind of similar frameworks with, with the other tools they interact with. Yeah. So then what, what I'll start doing now is I'll walk you through how to do a get in the API browser and we're gonna play with network object in all of the three tools that we're gonna be playing with here. And when I get to Python, I'll, I'll show you the code to do the authentication to make that clear. And that's something that we'll also be posting up on DevNet. So you don't have to memorize everything you see here, but at least we'll show kind of a quick example of how to do that. So I'm scrolling to network object here. So you look, there's categories of, uh, categories of URLs. So network object is where you'd find network object. And then to do a get, it's pretty simple here. I mean, the good news is you, you go to get, which is the HTTP method. And that, as, as Veer mentioned earlier, does a read on the object to retrieve that. And you can go in here. There's the ways you can look at the details with the browser. We're going to jump right into the result here. So if you click try it now, the good news with a get is you don't have to really give it anything. It'll just fetch all of the data in this case. So I click try it out and you'll see there's the curl URL. And the one thing to note here is it does not include the token because that's kind of hidden under the covers in the API browser here. And then, so you'll see like here, here's the curl, here's the full URL. So if, if you were, and what, one of the patterns that you'll use here, if I'm gonna go create calls in Postman is the, the best way is try it here, get the URL and, and then you can see what the response body should look like. So it kind of primes you for being able to use the other tool if, if you need to kind of reverse engineer it a little bit yourself. Another thing to note here is if I scroll up, you'll notice the URL shown here, objects networks, is, is basically a short form, it's abbreviated, and there's a prefix that goes in that URL slash API API FDM V1 objects networks. So the thing that you'll need to put if you're using Postman or, or actually some of it will be hidden in Python, but if you're using Postman or writing kind of a raw HTTP client, this is the full URL that you'll need to be aware of. And then in the response body, you can see the actual details behind the call, all the standard fields like our, our kind of random version that's used for put calls. And we've talked about that a little bit in some of our other videos. And then we have ID, which is the unique identifier, the type field, which is always mandatory if you do a, a post or a put operation. And then we have the self link to be able to fetch that object back. So de definitely a, a kind of a standard pattern there. And if we go over and look at Postman, so the thing with Postman, it doesn't include the token authentication. So I'll walk over here and I'll show you what that looks like. And there's two different calls here. We have one to do token authentication and I'll delve a little bit into what the, at least the basic token authentication looks like. And that has, that's a couple of, the, the way we'll set this up in Postman and there is a token API in the API Explorer here. So that actually is a, is, is a good way to kind of learn about what that looks like in all the, the options here is in token, we, we'll show you all the fields, but there actually is a bunch of data here that you don't need for the basic token authentication like the UI does. And I'll show you what that looks like, is you have, if for authorization, in this case, I'll put 
no auth, but that's because we're going to do it in kind of a custom way here in the body of the request. So in headers, we have two different headers. There's a content type header, and then there's an accept header. Both of those have application JSON. So pr pretty simple there. And the nice thing is in Postman, it will kind of auto-complete the keys, and it will give you a pull-down list to choose the values. So it keeps it nice and simple. I take the URL that I learned from going through the API Explorer, because first, when, when I wanted to learn what do I need to put in here, I experimented with the API Explorer, and when you do the test, it'll show you the, the full URL. And one thing that you'll learn is the prefix on all the URLs is consistent. So you have the API, FDM, V1, and then it's FDM token. So that's something that, you, I mean, there's this pattern where there's all this prefix, and then the URL that you'll see in the API Explorer here. So other than the headers, when I go into the body, and this is really the meat of, the, of this call, where you get grant type password. And if you notice over here, and actually if I go down to the request, which is what I should be showing you, you see grant type, and in this case it's showing custom token because there's multiple grant types. And over here, there, there's an enum that will actually show you all of the different values here. Password is one of them, and password's the simplest one here. So I'm using password. And notice here that other than password, we have username and password. And this, this literally is just the username and password in the body here. And this is going HTTPS. So it's, it's going through an encrypted pipe here. So no real concern here. And you, you don't pass this every call. You get the token once. Then you put the, the bearer token in the header for subsequent requests. So something to keep in mind. So once I get this, to, to send that, you can just try to click send here. And note here that the, the first thing I get, because I didn't fully configure this tool yet, is I'll get an error. And it says one of the reasons this could get an error is self-signed certificates are being blocked. So definitely something to keep in mind there is that the default we use is self-signed, as you see, not secure there. So they, to change that in Postman, if you go to File, Settings, and then you'll, you'll notice by default, SSL certificate verification is on. And we need to disable that because it's a self-signed cert. So I'll click that off close that dialog, I'll re-click send, and then you'll notice at the bottom I get the, the response body back. And in that response body, the key, the key thing that you really care about here is the access token. You can see the expire time, and that's a 30 minute lifetime there. The token type is bearer, and you'll also see a refresh token and when the refresh token expires. So what you the, the pattern that you can use here is you can use the access token when it's about to expire, you can do a refresh token and, and basically update or refresh your token with a new token. So I won't go into the details of that. We'll just use the access token itself here. That's the simplest thing. We also have other token types. And if you look in the details here, there's a custom token and we have documentation and the learning labs will bring, you, bring in more details on how to do custom tokens. It's not, it's basically the same process. You just change the body in the request and add some more fields to do a custom token. And when you do a custom token, you first have to get a normal token, this exact process, and then you use the normal token to get a custom token. It's definitely something to keep in mind there. So the Jared just mentioned uh, learning labs. Those learning labs are available on DevNet, so developers.cisco.com. Uh, that's where you will find those learning labs. Yep. And, and so with, with that, so once you get your access token, Next question is, okay, if I want to do the same thing we did over here with a network object, let's say I want to fetch that in Postman. So I, I've pre-set pre this up. I did the URL, which is the same URL that we learned on, on the other side. So that, that's pretty intuitive. On the headers, the, the key thing here is, is the authorization. And actually, in authorization, you do bearer token. And, and then the good thing is you just take the token from the other window that you found down here literally copy paste this whole string here for access token. So you copy paste that, you paste it in this token token box here, and you'll, that is the same token, or at least actually that's probably an earlier token I used. Let's see if, see if it hopefully still works here. And then here we, so the header, you have the authorization, the body in, the, in this case, it's a get, you don't need a, a body. And I'll click send. And actually, okay, this, this proves there are tokens timeout. So the, the earlier one I had entered timed out. So I'm gonna walk over here, I'll swap my token. Uh, 
I just copy paste. I got the character there. No, I'm off by one. Make sure you don't miss a character because that will definitely cause issues there. And I will go into authorization and I will replace this string with, with the new string. So let me first remove that, make sure it's empty. And I will paste in my new token. And that should be ready to go now. So from there, let me step back over here. I will click send. And now that worked. So what, what we did is we took the token that we just obtained a couple of moments ago in, in the other call through Postman, and then we pasted it in here as the authorization bearer token. I click send. And that when, when you did the authorization here, that put it in header. So that basically automated that part of the process. The send did the call to the server with the auth token. And then that pop, that then gives me the, the response. And you'll notice that this is basically the same thing that we got in the other window. We'll you see the name, the description, the value for this network object. And I mean, that, that's pretty much what, what there is to Postman. And I know Postman has so much advanced features if you want to go in and script going between calls. But this at least shows you how to, how to obtain a token, how to fetch, and you, how to use that token in a GET request and, and run with Postman. And ne next, we'll get into how to do this with Python, which gets kind of exciting here. So in, in, in here with Python, in, in this case, I, I'm, I'm going to be using Python. I'll technically be using IPython, which is an interactive uh, Python tool for doing things. And that's a great way to learn Python. So if you're learning Python, uh, interactive tool is, a, is the best way to learn because it tells you your uh, issues immediately. Yep. Yeah, it's, it's, it, otherwise, you have to write a script, run a script. This way, you can literally run it line by line. But for, first, I'll start by showing you some of the code, just so you get an idea of what. And, and this will be posted out in the learning lab uh, because this is an exercise that we want you to be able to do. So. Let me page down to the, the real interesting stuff here, which is how to log in. I'll show you briefly what a login and a custom login looks like. OK, I can fit most of both of those on the screen. So for login here, we have a couple of things. We got auth headers. And the headers here that gets expanded is really the, the content type in the accept header. So I won't, I won't scroll back up to that, but that's what I showed you in, in the other screen in Postman. So it's the same, same thing expanded there. And then you can see authorization bearer, and we get the, the bearer token included in this. Or, or actually, that, that's, yeah, that's doing. So this is where you are building uh, HTTP header. Yes. Is that correct? Yeah, this is building the HTTP header. And then we also have the payload here. And this, this should look very familiar after the last thing that we just did, because you'll see grant type password, same exact thing that we saw over in Postman. You'll see the username. And in this case, I have it kind of componentized in variables. So we have username and password that get passed in here, same as in Postman. And then I, here, I, for debug purposes, because this is a learning exercise, I, I output the headers that we get. And we can look at this in a minute when we actually run the code. And it will dump that out. And then here, we just do the, the request to actually post that to the URL. And that URL is identical to what we did in Postman. So again, same thing in code versus Postman. We're getting done. And then at the, at the end, you'll notice in code here, we take the access token and we actually save it to a variable. Because if you do repeated calls, you want to keep reusing that access token. So that's something we kind of stash away to reuse. For a custom login, almost the same thing. A couple of uh, minor changes here. We have grant type custom token. So it's a different grant type. The other one was password. This is custom token, so keep that in mind. You have desired expires in, desired refresh expires in, and desired subject, which is the client that's logging in there. And then you have desired refresh count. So there's a couple of additional things that you need to populate in the case of the custom token, but it's not honestly that complicated. Most of it you can put kind of fixed fixed values into once you learn once you figure out how long you want your token to last and, and those kind of details. So one thing I realized, Jared, is that 
since we changed the enum type from password to custom token, yeah. uh, this custom token actually we as a user generate and put somewhere in the UI or where does this custom token comes from? How does server matches that custom token? So what what you do is fir first you get a normal a normal token via password like we like okay. we showed the previous method. You take that token, you pass that in the header in, in this call to retrieve a custom token. And the, what, really what the custom token is, is it's a longer lived token. So the other, the other token has a lifetime of 30 minutes. And that's, that's a good, good point to clarify that. And so like, why would I want a custom token yes. is, is really the, the root question here. The, the, the most useful thing I found to use a custom token for is if I'm writing scripts, and it's a script I'm gonna be running for an hour or two, the easiest way to not have to go write refresh logic is allocate a custom token, make the lifetime of that custom token a day. Yeah. Or, 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 or if, if you have a really long running process, you could make it a month or, or something like that or a week or whatever duration you want. Or you whatever can... the policy of a certain organization yes. allows that. Yeah, if, if you have a security policy that yeah. says the longest lived session is four hours yeah. or whatever it is, you, you can customize that so your API programming code can be compliant and you can allocate whatever's needed there. But it, it, yeah, usually it's to extend the life of a session is the use case for doing this. So we have, we have that, and then one other thing that I want to show you is we're using in, in Python a library called Bravado. And what, one of the cool things here is this library consumes open API spec and creates what amounts to an SDK to program against our API calls. So th this is fairly simple code that you can go to the Bravado website and see, or we'll have sample code up on DevNet to go do this. And so Jared, yeah. uh, what you are saying here, and sorry to interrupt again, is that um, we are publishing the spec for the API. Yes, and, and one, one of the things you'll notice in here, and, and you can actually see, see this in the sample code here, you see the call to this ngfw.json file, that is the open API spec that's on the device that can be retrieved over HTTP. It's a very good point that in, so what, the, what this really is doing is it takes a Swagger client, which is the Bravado Swagger client, and it will suck in the open API spec. And because Python's kind of, it, it can do pretty magical stuff in, in terms of like in, injecting a schema and creating an API under the covers without, because it's a scripting language, you don't need the compilation step yeah. um, with, with, that you would need in other strongly typed languages. So that, that's why Python's so easy to show this. So it'll consume the open API spec give you back this, and here I have it called bravado client. And, and this method here, get client, is just to retrieve a raw bravado client because I wanted to show you what raw bravado looks like if I'm interacting with that API. So this, really this file, what it's doing is it logs in, it retrieves a token, creates a bravado client, and I call get client, and that will hand back the client. And we'll walk through using this. And then once you have the bravado client, you can then make calls against it, and we'll show you in IPython how that works. So that's probably a good kind of segue into let's let's start programming against it. So I will exit out of looking at my little sample file here. And what I'll do is I'm I'm going to use IPython. So I have a question, Jared. Sure. So it looks like you you have a Unix uh, like prompt there. So Python can run on Windows, Mac, or or Linux or Unix, so it, it's not necessarily that you should have a Unix-based uh, system to try this out. So great, great question. I, I think there's a bunch of options. In, in in my case here, I'm actually running Docker um, with an Ubuntu image on top of Windows. You could totally natively run, and and I've done this on on my laptop, is to just natively run Python and IPython and all that stuff directly on top of Windows. So that's completely an option. This should also work on a Mac or any, pretty much any platform that can run Python, you should be able to do this. So lo lots of options. I just ran Docker because I like a Unix shell, um, but, but tons of options there. So I'll start I IPython here. And IPython, as we mentioned earlier, is an interactive Python shell. So what I can do here is first I need to kind of import the code I'm gonna be working with. And I have this package called simple client. Or, the, or a file called simple client, uh, and I'm gonna import FTD client. So I, now that I've, I've imported that code I, so I can start to use it, and what I'm gonna do is instantiate a client, and to do that, I need to do FTD client. 
Uh, and so sorry to interrupt again, Jared. So yeah. well, when you say from simple client, so is simple client is a package? Yeah, so simple client is the, I, I have a source file called simple underscore client dot py. Okay. Um, that's the file that contains the class called FTD client. Okay. So what I'm, I'm basically saying is from that file, import FTD client. So okay. yeah, it's a pretty, pretty simple step there. And what I'll do is address and my box is kind of alias to ftd.cisco.com. So I'm going to tell it that's the address that I want to connect to. And then port, I, I have it hard coded to the port in, in my pod here. Um, so I'll just leave that by default and we will create that. So the next step that we need to do is we made the client, we're not logged in yet. So since, since we're going to do something pretty quick here, I will do just the, the normal login. So we'll do client.login. So one thing I, I want to mention, people watching, is that if interactive Python, if, if the statement is wrong, you will know error right away. Yeah you don't have to wait. So when he's entering something and it's coming uh, out to be perfectly fine, that means there is no errors. Yeah. And the one, one thing to note why you see this kind of garbage in the middle is I did tab, and it'll tab complete. Actually, I can go back and show, if I do login like this, you'll see there's login and there's login custom, is I showed that there were the two different login methods, and I just wanted to do standard login here to keep it simple. So I'll click that, and you'll see some output here. You can actually see authentication headers you can see the accept application JSON, and you can actually see the uh, my annotation tool here. You see the content type application JSON, and you'll see authorization bearer that you can do there. And then the body here, so the actual payload, you'll see grant type password right here. You see username admin, password admin123. And again, this is going through an HTTP connection, so it's, it's secure. So that goes over. And then I, I didn't print out the bearer token that you get back, but it, that, that's there. But that, that's the content to do the request, which matches pretty much what we did in Postman. So that's the first step there. The next thing I will do is I will get a Bravado client so we can then directly play with Bravado. So now we have an authenticated, authenticated session here. So I'll do client or I'll do, I'll just name my variable B client for bravado client, and I will assign that to client.getClient, client. and that was the method that I showed earlier to retrieve the bravado client. So that just gives, gives me that, and that, that call will take a second or two. So then with B client, the cool thing here is if I do period, and this is where IPython comes very much in handy, I'll do a tab. Notice you'll see a ton of stuff here. And these match to the different categories that you see in the API browser. So and actually, the key, key one to note here is you'll see network object. And network object is basically the, the, the class of things that I can interact with there is, is network object. And then if I put network object to a period, and I'll show you this in one second, and do a tab again, it'll show me all the methods I can do on network object that map to all the URLs that we showed both in the API, bro in, in the API browser. Yeah, so people watching at, uh, at home, um, uh, this is actually the power of publishing the spec, which yeah. we talked about. And so this API comes with the spec, and, and you, this is the reason why Bravado Client can pull all these objects. Yeah, and, and note, I, I did not write code yeah. to go tell it all these new object yes. types. It's just the spec that Very pulled powerful. it down Very and powerful. dynamically kind of made this API under the covers. So what, what we'll do now is I'll, I'll show you for network object, and I'll do period, and you can see this gets expanded. And there's a bunch of different calls. You'll see there's add calls right, right, kind of right here, add network object. There are delete calls to remove a network object. There are edit calls. There's get network object to receive a single network object. And one of the methods I like to, to use typically is the list method. So pretty much everything will have a get kind of object type list at the end. And that'll retrieve a list of objects, very, very much the same as the call that we did in the API Explorer. So it's an easy way to play around. So what we'll next do is I will do, just make sure this is in focus. And I didn't, so let, let me do up. And then I will do get, let it expand that. So it does get network object, type an L, then tab, we'll get list, which gets that method. And one of the things you'll notice, I'll, I'll click enter, 
And you'll see it, it gives you an HTTP future. So one of the things that you want to do to actually execute it, because it'll give you an HTTP future, you have to tell it, give me the result of that. So it hasn't yet run the call. So what I do is I stack this result method on the end. And what that does is, is it then runs it. And you'll see this looks a little messy. So what I'll, I'll show you a way that you can kind of pick this apart. So one of the first things you'll notice is there's this items, like right, right here, which is basically the array of different network objects that you get. So the, what I'll do is I'll, I'll pick the first item off the list. So what we'll do is we'll rerun that command. And then I will put, say, hey, give me items, which is just the raw list of items here. And I'm going to say, give me the first element of that list. And then that gives me one, one object here. Another thing, just to make it easier to read, is in Python under the covers, objects are basically a dictionary. So one of the things you kind of cheat here, and you can say, give me dict. And it, it, it just, the, I mean, the nice thing here is it makes it more readable. So if you notice here, you'll see that I see the ID, is it system defined, the name, the type, the version, the links, and the value, which is really the heart of the network object right here. And you can see the subtype is network on this one. It has the slash 24 to denote that it actually is a network and not a host. So you can tell the difference there. So this walked us through fetching a network object, the process for doing an edit, um, which, is, which is an update or a create is also very, very simple to walk through this. So that's pretty much what I had here to show in terms of how to use Bravado to interact with and, cr and retrieve a network object. And do you have any questions, Mir? Uh, no, this was great. I think uh, the, one of the biggest power uh, which I have discovered is the, the publication of the uh, open API spec, and which has made our uh, life very simple to actually uh, use the tool chain like Bravado and write code really quickly against this API. So thank you, Jared, and thank you, everyone watching at home. Cool. Thank you very much.